Greetings, everyone. It's very nice to be with you today. Now we're ready for this month's questions and answers. So our first question is, what are the objectives of the daily meditation and how is it properly done? In the very first set of Rosicrucian monographs, we receive instructions on a meditation that we can do every day. We also publish these instructions in the Rosicrucian Form magazine. And this is a technique used to facilitate attunement with cosmic consciousness. So we're encouraged to intone a different vowel sound on each day of the week. And these vowel sounds are not associated with that day of the week. It's just, we're focusing on seven vowel sounds that stimulate seven psychic centers in our being. So we recommend that one of each of the seven days of the week, we intone those vowel sounds. So the purpose of this meditation is to stimulate the energy centers in our being that Rosicrucians call psychic centers. And here's what a Rosicrucian manuscript says about the psychic centers and about this process. Psychic consciousness is present throughout our, our entire being. Our psychic consciousness is not just in one psychic center or just in the heart or just in our brain. It vibrates within every cell in our being. And specifically, it permeates the nucleus of each cell of our body. So psychic consciousness is throughout our being. Our unawareness of the psychic stimuli constantly bombarding us is simply due to our inability to interpret them. So psychic stimuli are coming to us all the time, but we're not always able to interpret them. The hypothalamus is responsible for such interpretation, and therefore the psychic stimuli must not be reaching it. Why? Because our major psychic centers, due to their lack of development, cannot transfer the stimuli. As the manifestation of our psychic consciousness, the subconscious acts through the intermediary of our autonomic nervous system whose activities are centered in the hypothalamus. And we have practiced many exercises together that help to stimulate and tone the autonomic nervous system. So this manuscript continues, as our subconscious is one of the major manifestations of our psychic consciousness, the best way to increase our attunement with it is through the development of our psychic centers. To achieve perfect co cosmic harmonization, we must use our subconscious as an intermediary, since it is the subconscious that constitutes the symbolic portal providing access to cosmic consciousness. So that's the purpose of this meditation, is to build the psychic centers so that we can um, attune with cosmic consciousness. And here is just a little something about what is the subconscious. One, the subconscious controls all the involuntary actions of our physical body and makes possible the accomplishment of all voluntary actions. Two, as the manifestation of our psychic consciousness the subconscious acts through the intermediary of our autonomic nervous system, whose activities are centered in the hypothalamus. Three, due to the close bond existing between the subconscious and the psychic centers of the body, the development of these centers makes us more receptive to cosmic inspiration. Four, Apart from our psychic consciousness, the subconscious, 
of all the phases of human consciousness is the one that is closest to cosmic consciousness. Therefore, in order for us to harmonize with the highest spiritual planes, we must attain the higher levels of our subconscious. We've spoken about the psychic centers in the past, and the psychic centers are, are centers of energy and information in our being where a lot of nerves come together. And they're associated either with an organ, a gland, or in one case with a plexus, which is the solar plexus. And the Rosicrucian monographs give us many techniques to strengthen and stimulate these psychic centers. I'm sure you can think of many of them. We intone vowel sounds. So this daily meditation intones the vowel sound with a specific psychic center. And in that first set of monographs, in an early monograph, it shows which vowel sound stimulates which psychic center. And it also shows the color that's associated with it. We can also build the psychic centers just by placing our awareness on them. Again, they're centers of energy and information. So by placing our awareness on these centers, we help to develop them and to expand our awareness of their energy. Also, we can place our hands on these centers. So when we're intoning them, we can place our hands on the different psychic centers. The psychic centers and this meditation are described in detail in a higher degree in the monographs. However, this is so important that we include an introduction to this meditation in the very earliest monographs. We have, we have moved this information, this meditation with the psychic centers to the very first set of lessons that members receive. Now, I mentioned all these different ways that we can stimulate the psychic centers and this the meditation is described in detail. It's important that as you learn about different techniques that you can apply, that you don't become so overwhelmed by all the different, by, by practicing all the different exercises that you think, I don't have time to do these, so you stop doing them. So we suggest that if you're able to take a few moments every day and practice this meditation, that's a good one to start with. And again, we're introduced to so many valuable lessons in the Rosicrucian teachings that we probably want to apply all of them. And just keep in mind that if it, if it becomes too much for you, it's important that you don't stop doing everything because you're thinking, I don't have time for this, I have to get to work. So choose what works for you with your situation. And if you're able to do the, the daily meditation early in your Rosicrucian membership, in my experience, you will find it to be extremely valuable. Now, I just mentioned that the Rosicrucian manuscript said that in order to attune with cosmic consciousness and to be aware of vibrations that are around us all the time, we need to open up our ability to receive these impressions. And we also need to remove the distractions. So in some ways, we set up distractions and obstacles to being able to perceive these vibrations that are around us all the time. And we do this sometimes through um, what we what well, we definitely do it through our thoughts. And our thoughts are often influenced by what we read, what we watch on television, what we see on the internet, the people we associate with, um, 
So if we want to attune with cosmic consciousness, we would keep all we would keep this in mind with all of those activities that I just mentioned. So we can read inspiring books. We can be around people who uplift us. We can watch um, inspiring television or read in inspiring stories on the internet. Also, our diet is important and focusing on eating healthy food, drinking pure water, getting plenty of fresh air. And it's especially helpful if we're able to take walks out in nature. A few years ago, Stanford University published the results of a study that they did that showed the benefits of walking out in nature versus taking the same length of walk in a big city. And of course, anytime we can get exercise, that's fantastic. And when we're surrounded, when we're nestled within nature, it affects a part of our brain that helps us to stop ruminating. It's called the subgenual prefrontal cortex. And we evolved, our, our ancestors needed to ruminate so that they didn't repeat a situation that might be life-threatening. And we still need to, to think about some things, but Sometimes we ruminate too much when it's not helpful to us anymore. So this study from Stanford University showed that when we're out in nature, it helps to turn off that part of the brain that ruminates. It also, again, comparing walking and exercising out in nature versus doing the same exercises in uh, not out in nature, uh, it produces less anxiety, improves our memory. We have fewer negative thoughts. It lowers the risk of mental illness. It creates less depression, helps us to better deal with stress. So all of these benefits come from spending time in nature. And um, so this is something that as, much, as often as we're able to do, it's a very simple technique just to take a nice walk out in nature and observe and experience how it affects our entire being. Now, another member submitted a question that's related to this question. Do you have suggestions for achieving deep meditation? So. A very simple technique is to remove distractions. And we're encouraged early on in our membership to establish a sanctum for our Rosicrucian studies. And this immediately removes the distractions. We're not being bombarded with stimuli. We're not being overwhelmed with a lot of information that happens in many of our lives. So first, we can remove distractions. Another technique that's introduced early in the Rosicrucian teachings is uh, that helps to achieve deep meditation is to focus on our breath. And researchers have found that it helps us to go even deeper if our exhalation is longer than our inhalation. And we're gonna practice this in a moment. Research has also found that there are benefits to exhaling with our lips pursed. Now, this technique is not presented in the Rosicrucian monographs. I'm just presenting this um, as something you can experiment with. So we'll do this now. If you would sit comfortably, and take three deep breaths, becoming more relaxed with each exhalation.
And now breathe in. And when you exhale, purse your lips and silently exhale through your lips, making that exhalation longer. Draw out the exhalation. And again, breathe in. When you exhale, purse your lips. Make the exhalation longer than the inhalation. Now let's practice this for a couple of minutes. And when you do this with every exhalation, count up to 10. So with the first inhalation, you breathe in. As you exhale with that long exhalation, mentally think one. Breathe in again. With that long exhalation, think two. So continue that, count up to 10, and then when you reach 10, start over again. Do one to 10. We'll do this for a couple of minutes. Now just breathe naturally. Focus your attention on your nostrils as the air goes in and out of your nostrils. Just breathe normally. If your mind wanders, gently bring it back to feeling the air going in and out of your nostrils.
when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Just make a mental note of your inner state, how you're feeling. These techniques can help us to go deeper in our meditation. You can practice this if you participate in an affiliated body and you're waiting to go into the temple. Just sit in the pranayos of the temple and focus on your breath. It will help to prepare you for the convocation. You can do this at the beginning of your sanctum period. When we focus on our breath like this, it signals to the autonomic nervous system that's every, that everything is okay. You know, the autonomic nervous system is watching for threats to see, okay, do I need to inc increase blood pressure or respiration? Do I need to dilate the pupils? So if we're breathing normally, it's communicating to the autonomic nervous system, there are no threats. Because when there's a threat, we don't breathe normally. We don't breathe nice and calmly. So then your body just takes it from there, creating this sense of tranquility throughout your entire being. So we're just so fortunate with the Rosicrucian teachings that we have so many techniques that can help us to deepen our meditations, to attune with cosmic consciousness, to develop our psychic centers. Here's our next question. Please define solitude versus loneliness. Is it harmful to enjoy solitude and limit your interactions with family members and friends who, to, who continue to engage in unmindful and destructive behavior patterns. I mentioned that the latest issue of the Rosicrucian Forum magazine is now available in your member portal. And there happens to be an article entitled Solitude in this forum written by past imperator Christian Bernard. And I'd like to share a few quotations that he included in this article that I, I, that I really appreciate. The first is by Paul Tillich. Our language has wisely sensed the two sides of being alone. It has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone. And it has created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. Again, that's by Paul Tillich. And Lord Byron wrote, in solitude, where we are least alone. In solitude, where we are least alone. Another quotation in this article is by Ruth Fischel. I will take time to be alone today. I will take time to be quiet. In this silence, I will listen and I will hear my answers. Let's just take a moment to be silent be quiet, and in this silence, we'll listen and we'll hear our answers. So just take a minute or so.
Again, that article is in the Rosicrucian Forum. It's by our past imperator, Christian Bernard. The other articles uh, that you may find interesting in that issue of the forum is um, our imperator, Claudio Mazzucco, Our Contribution to Society. And by past imperator, Ralph Lewis, How Should We Regard Death? And by our past imperator, H. Spencer Lewis, how to pray. So it's interesting to consider uh, solitude versus loneliness. Next year, we're planning a number of member retreats, setting the conditions uh, for us to have transformative experiences. These are going to be experiences. These, these retreats will provide the opportunities for solitude. We'll be with other Rosicrucians and we'll have a ch chance to have the necessary solitude to go within. So we'll be announcing these retreats in the next few months for 2024. And in our sanctums, we have the opportunity for solitude. Again, we're away from distractions. We're away from overwhelm. The second part of this question from this member is, is it harmful to enjoy solitude and limit your interactions with family members and friends who continue to engage in unmindful and destructive behavior patterns? So each of us has to decide if it's best for us to spend time with people who are on a very different path. Now, of course, you should never put yourself in a position where you can be abused or harmed in any way. And if someone is unmindful, maybe we can ask ourselves if we can be of any help to this other person, of an unmindful person, or if we can learn anything from them. Maybe you can be a role model for them. Although, of course, Rosicrucians are always very careful not to appear like know-it-alls. But maybe just our behavior can be a, a model. The Rosicrucian Code of Life has a list of ideas that might be helpful in our lives. And the Rosicrucian Code number seven says, behave in such a way that all those who share your existence or live in contact with you regard you as an example and feel the desire to be like you. Guided by the voice of your conscience, may your ethics be as pure as possible. And may your first preoccupation be always to think well, speak well, and act well. Another point in the Rosicrucian Code of Life, this is number five, says, you know that the aim of all human beings is to perfect ourselves, to become better persons. Therefore, constantly endeavor to awaken and express the virtues of the soul that animate you. In doing so, you will contribute to your evolution and serve the cause of humanity. Rosicrucians don't act like we're sages, and we can behave in ways that may inspire others. For those of you who are Martinist, you know that from a Martinist perspective, we won't achieve enlightenment until everyone does. There's a Martinist manuscript that says, as one member of society suffers once or is sick, so ultimately, will each member of society be affected? And again, the Rosicrucian Code of Life, this time point number 20 says, the purpose of the order is to contribute to the raising of consciousness and the transmission of its centuries old teachings. So maybe your example can inspire someone else to grow. And if it's your family members or close friends and you know you're going to be with them, you can plan on how you want to behave with them, how you want to interact, how you, how you want to interact. I've spoken before about Stoicism, which has a lot of similarities with the Rosicrucian teachings. 
And I especially admire the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who was a devout Stoic. And he prepared himself each morning to deal with people that he knew might be troublesome. And he, um, he had a lot of those interactions. His uh, people very, very close to him betrayed him. His, most, his closest and most trusted general committed treason against him. Eight of his 13 children died before he did. He experienced so much um, in his life. His son, Commodus, was inept and destructive. Marcus Aurelius wrote a personal journal, and it was found after he passed on, after his tran transition. And it's called the Meditations, but it was his personal jour journal. And he wrote, Begin each day by telling yourself, today I shall be meeting with interference, ingratitude, insolence, disloyalty, ill will, and selfishness, all of them due to the offender's ignorance of what is good or evil. But for my part, I have long perceived the nature of good and its nobility, the nature of evil and its meanness, and also the nature of the culprit himself, who is my brother, not in the physical sense, but as a fellow creature, similarly endowed with reason and a share of the divine. Therefore, none of those things can injure me, for no one can implicate me in what is degrading. End quote. Marcus Aurelius wrote that we should view others' actions in terms of two perspectives. Either they are doing what is right or they, is do, or they are doing what is wrong. If they're doing what is right, then we should accept it and cease to be annoyed with them. We should let go of our anger and learn from them. There have been times that after I've had a little distance from a situation, I realized, oh, that other person was right and I was wrong. It's not easy to do, at least in my experience, and it usually requires some time but it's possible the other person is right. Marcus Aurelius continued, he said, if what the other person doing, if what the other person is doing is wrong, then you should assume it's because they don't know any better. So if we interact with people who are unmindful, they don't know any better. If someone is genuinely mistaken about what is right, you should, if anything, feel sorry for them. And once you really understand their thinking, there's no reason for you to be surprised by their actions, which may lessen your feelings of anger. Now, that isn't easy either, but we can set this as our goal and give it our best. And again, this is never with people who um, are abusing us or, or intend to do harm to us. Back to the Rosicrucian Code of Life, it says, never use the faculty of judgment to blame or condemn anyone, for you cannot read the hearts and souls of others. Look at them benevolently and leniently and see what is best in them. And as I mentioned earlier, the Code of Life says, never cause anyone to believe that members of the order are sages who are in full possession of the truth. To those who may ask, present yourself as a philosophical person who is seeking wisdom. Never pretend you are a rose qua, but say you are a perfecting Rosicrucian. So again, it's up to each of us to decide if it's if we're in a position where we have no choice but to be with unmindful people, what our interactions will be. Next question is, is there a mystical explanation for the phenomenon known as sleep paralysis? So the monographs do not cover if there is a mystical explanation for sleep paralysis. It describes the condition. It says it occurs during the night and weakens the body for a day or so. And the vowel sound that can be helpful with this is to intone uh, the vowel sound ke for meditation before going to sleep. 
And in 2019, we had a Rosicrucian Digest magazine that focused on radiant health. And it includes a meditation that's helpful to perform right before we go to sleep. So um, again, that's in the Radiant Health Digest. Our next question. It is stated that the cosmic becomes conscious of itself through the avenue of self-conscious beings like humans. In that case, does the cosmic know anything that is not known to any human or living being in the universe? What a good question. The monographs state that the goal of life is to serve as a vehicle for the divine to untiringly contemplate its own reflection. So purpose of our incarnating is so that the divine can untiringly contemplate its own reflection. The cosmic is every living being in the universe. It's all of our energy. As each of us becomes more conscious, our awareness expands and thus our knowledge and understanding increases. And through this process, the cosmic itself becomes more aware. This reminds me of a meditation. When we send good thoughts to all beings on earth or to all of humanity, sometimes I stop and think, okay, I'm sending those thoughts, but I'm also receiving those thoughts at the same time. So it's both that we're giving and receiving. Here's a related question. When a person is said to have cosmic consciousness, are there any limits to the person's knowledge? Does the person know everything or is the person simply aware of a unity or oneness with the cosmic? And some of you may have an experience with this where you know the answer to this question. Maybe you know if it's uh, a feeling of, do you know everything or is it a Simply, you're simply aware of oneness or unity with the cosmic. Everything that any unique person experience, experiences is perceived through their aspect of the cosmic reality. So we th see things through our perspective and thus will experience cosmic consciousness differently. For example, we could say that both the master Jesus and Buddha experienced cosmic consciousness and the way that they experienced it and described it was quite different. And you're probably familiar with the analogy that's used in the monographs, that there's a string of lights and that's the source. And we all are the bulbs and we could be a blue bulb or a green bulb or a red bulb. And it's how the source enlivens us, how, how we experience the source. Our next question, what does it mean to hold positive thoughts? What are we supposed to be, what are we supposed to be doing at that time? We could say that our thought, we could say that thoughts that contribute to our well-being and the well-being of others are positive thoughts. And we can also consider does it help us to focus on the negative or to complain about what is instead of doing what we can do about it? Or to acknowledge what is and to acknowledge that this too will pass. In the third atrium degree, good, and I'm, I'm sharing this because I think it's related to the idea of positive, good is defined as being the entirety of thoughts, words and actions that contribute directly or indirectly to the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of humanity. So again, what does it mean to hold positive thoughts? And of course, we also know that nothing is actually good or bad, but it's our thoughts that make it so. As William Shakespeare said so eloquently, 
through his character, Hamlet. Our next question. At times, doubt, doubts of not being connected to the order well in, particularly when you feel that there is no significant difference happening in your life different from others. When you apply the experiments or the principles without significant change. That the order is there for us and we are there for the order. How do, oh, hold on, I'm, I skipped a sentence. How do we know that we are still with the order and that we are advancing? That the order is there for us and we are there for the order. That we are still connected to the egregore. If you're a Rosicrucian, you are still connected to the egregore. You're a part of the egregore. The clearest definition of the egregore that I have experienced was by our imperator. And he said, the egregore exists in the psychic dimension. It's a psychic structure formed by the thoughts of all Rosicrucians, past and present. And it creates a psychic cloud. You can harmonize yourself with it. For example, in the Council of Solace, you can feel it acting in your body. And you can attune with it to help other people. Whenever you think of a Rosicrucian ritual or teaching, you are connected with this cloud. You feel the presence of this cloud close to you. When we need help, we can feel this presence. It's alive and we nourish it with our good thoughts as our frauders and sorors in the past have done. Every group creates its vibration, its frequency, and we can be supported by the Rosicrucian egregore. Regarding the question of are we advancing, this is one of the reasons why it's helpful to keep a Rosicrucian notebook. You can go back and look, oh, wow, I learned this, and I didn't know that before I was a Rosicrucian. You can see everything you've learned and experienced over the years. And if you keep a personal journal, you can look at your personal journal and see how your perspectives or knowledge may have expanded. Maybe you've become more kind or generous or understanding. And also, it's if you're having questions about are these um, are the experiment am I am I experiencing the experiments fully? Make sure that you are studying in your sanctum. This will be this is very important that you're not reading your monographs on the couch. That you go to your sanctum regularly that you practice the ritual at the beginning, that you have this space that's just used for your mystical work. In this way, it becomes like one long sanctum from our very first sanctum to the last sanctum period that we experience before our transition. We, we open our first sanctum and then we just adjourn. We just pause and go do other things, and then we come back to our sanctum. So you may find that helpful too. The next question. What is a typical day like in the life of the Grand Master? Like any member, I apply what I can from the Rosicrucian teachings First thing in the morning, I start every day with an hour of meditation. As soon as I wake up, I meditate. And then as many of us do, I will go outdoors or I will stand by an open window and I'll do seven deep breaths and thank the God of my heart for another day of conscious awareness. And I pause and consider how I want to behave that day reminding myself of the ideal that I want to achieve. And I know this, this isn't what I do as a grandmaster. This is, this is my personal practice. And um, every morning for 20 minutes minimum, I go to my sanctum 
and send good wishes to the Imperator and the other Grand Masters, the affiliated bodies officers, and to all members, as well as sending healing thoughts to our planet and all beings. And then I do that at night before I go to sleep. Then I work on whatever projects are a priority at that time. There really is no typical day. Um, I prepare and present programs. I am frequently communicating with members. I serve as one of our class masters. I review the monographs that we translate and make available. And we are just wrapping up the translation of the last of the 12th temple degree monographs. So this has been a um, very long process. And in the 12th degree, there are 360 monographs. So um, we're wrapping those up now. We're updating the child culture series, which is a very exciting project. We're creating a new Rosicrucian app for parents. We're creating new AMORC and TMO videos. I also work on ongoing projects like the Rosicrucian Digest, the Rosicrucian Forum, the TMO Panticle. And we have that wonderful museum. And I'm very involved with the programs and presentations there. We also have the spectacular new Alchemy Museum at Rosicrucian Park that we're working on. Um, another project, and it all depends on, as I said, the, the, the priority at the time, depends on the time of year. The, uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of the Rose Quad Journal, so I review the papers that are submitted to the Rose Quad Journal at the end of the process. And our, we have a whole team working on the Rose Quad Journal throughout the year. And I'd especially like to acknowledge our assistant editor-in-chief, Ingrid Young, and our publications manager, Josh Norman. They, they um, spend incredible amounts of time and energy on the Rose Quad Journal. And we have this whole team, as I said, of uh, reviewers and translators and editors, as well as the individuals who submit papers. Let me just say again, if you're an expert in a field, I invite you to look at the guidelines for submission at rosequadjournal.org and consider submitting a paper. Also, uh, all of the Grand Masters serve as directors on the board of the Supreme Grand Lodge. So I'm involved in those activities as well. And I also serve as the secretary of the board of directors of the Supreme Grand Lodge. So there's always something interesting to do. And one other personal thing that I try to do, well, no, not try to do, that I do every day is to get my 10,000 steps in. You've heard me say this, it is so good for our health. So every day I walk 10,000 steps so that I can stay healthy and strong and continue to participate in all these other exciting activities. So again, in the morning, a morning meditation, the seven deep breaths, uh, sanctum period and 10,000 steps. The next question, are there any vowel sounds that would aid in the healing process of eye related issues when it comes to the retina, macular edema, glaucoma, et cetera? It's related to eye pressure. So the vowel sound is K-E. Also, there's an exercise and you, you must be very careful if you have an eye issue, but you take your thumb and the first two fingers and you gently place your fingers on your eyelids. And if you have excessive pressure, then you would practice negative breathing, which means that you hold your lungs, you hold your breath when the lungs are empty. So here's our last question. How can we have free will and believe in fate at the same time? There's an exclamation point. Wouldn't free will negate fate? This is another great question and one that philosophers have asked for millennia. In the Rosicrucian tradition, in the Rosicrucian teachings, it states that we have free will. 
And the eighth temple degree monographs talk about this in particular. We have free will that helps us to learn lessons and to grow. And feedback is provided by karma so we know how we are doing. So I remember hearing from another tradition this analogy that imagine that when we're born, there's an arrow that's released and it's on a particular trajectory. It goes in a particular direction, but sometimes it may hit something or come across wind or something else that affects the trajectory. Those bumps may include actions of our free will. So all of our actions move us in a certain direction. And we, the purpose of free will is so that we can learn and grow from those experiences. And feedback is provided by karma. And it's both positive and negative feedback or karma, or it's just karma. It's not really positive or negative. Okay, so that concludes our questions and answers for this month. Thank you all so much for participating.